Gina McCarthy, and I am the president and CEO of the Natural Resources Defense Council. I'm also the advisory board chair at Harvard Center for Climate, Health, and the Global Environment. And I was the 13th administrator of the United States Environmental Protection Agency under President Barack Obama. With President Obama, I think we made tremendous progress on public health and the protection of the natural resources that we all depend on. We had a serious focus on climate change, which I think we want to talk in more detail about today. Uh, because climate change isn't a planetary problem, it's a people problem. And so we worked hard to eliminate the carbon emissions that fuel climate change from the power sector, which was a clean power plan. And we worked hard in Paris to have a worldwide agreement on how we could finally tackle the climate change issue on the scale that it deserves. And a lot of this work and, and my interest in this came from my 35 year history working for government. I worked at the local, state and federal levels. I worked for six governors, five of them were Republicans and one was a Democrat. And we all understood that our challenge in the environment is directly related to our ability to live healthy lives. And we always wanted to make progress on clean air and clean water. Um, and the land uh, that we live in and making sure that we have healthy places for our kids. And we worked as a democracy from the bottom up to demand action. And that's where all of the laws came from that, we've, that has allowed us to make some tremendous progress. So there's hope that we can make progress on climate too. And there's hope that people will begin to understand that it isn't a planetary problem. It's about you, your health, your family, your future in particular. And I want to talk through some of those connections as, as we move forward. You know, let's talk a little bit in more detail about the connection between climate and health, because it's not as intuitive as at least I think it should be. And that is that over time, you know, as, as the population of people grew across the world. What happened is that the demand on environmental resources grew exponentially. And so that meant that our forests and our wetland areas and our grasslands were being taken up to grow food from agriculture. And that still is a significant problem today. And all, all those areas are places where the carbon is held in the soil and it's, and it's protected from being emitted that contribute to uh, climate change and, and what some people call global warming. And at the same time, you know, the demands for energy grew and we have released more and more emissions, carbon emissions from fossil fuels. And, and that's the situation that we continue to find ourselves in. And in those two factors, this overconsumption this lack of protection of natural resources is what we have to protect against. And you can see the results of that today. We don't have to scientifically prove it. You can already see it. So, so here are some examples of what's happening today that are directly related to this, this pressure on our natural resources that are unsustainable and the impact that's having on our planet. And so we can look at, at things like the wildfires in California. That's perhaps the most stark example. We can look at what happened in paradise. How many people were literally killed as a result of the dry land and, uh, and the, the, the inability for us to be able to uh, keep people safe in areas that are so dry because of the heat and that had significant uh, overwatering from rain in the in the rainy season. So you had grasslands that grew, dryness in the summer, and as a result, it was just a tinderbox. And we should know these things now and prepare for them. But the result was not just a hazard to those populations that live there. It was I was in San Francisco at the time that that paradise was burning. People were walking in the streets of San Francisco with masks on. 
they, they understood that the pollution from there was traveling not just there, but went halfway across the country. And it impacted people's ability all across the country to be able to protect themselves from that kind of air pollution that would trigger asthma attacks and make changes. And we have folks in the Midwest, even this, this past year, that have seen the flooding of the Missouri River and the, and the Mississippi River that has resulted in significant damage to agricultural lands, farms that have been families for generations now no longer exist because those rivers are taking their natural course. We thought we could levy them. We cannot. Nature always wins, especially when you have extreme floods that we're now seeing as a result of changing climate. And you have this, this confluence of issues which should be telling us today, not just that climate change is real, but in each and every one of these cases, there are human beings' lives that are being changed. There's safety concerns that they have that they never thought they would have to face. We see tornadoes and other intense storms that are making people not just impacted directly, but feel a sense that the future, their present is not available to them or within their control or their children's future. That's the kind of work that we need to do to make the connection between public health and climate. But the next goal is to make sure that we look on our 50 year of history and Earth Day to show us what we can do together to face these challenges together and how we have to have the courage to face it and the hope and expectation that when we do, we will win. And I believe that is true from the bottom of my toes to the tip of my graying head. We can make change happen. We can address it. We can make the future safe for you, but also do it in a way that makes the present safer, healthier, more sustainable and equitable today. As educators and as teachers, and as just moms and dads, we have to tell our kids that the youth movement today is what's gonna change things. They are getting active and they can get active in their communities. There are kids everywhere reaching into their schools, demanding that, that those schools generate their electricity through renewable energy. There's opportunities you have locally to get solar panels on top of, of your roofs. So there's an ability for our kids to not have to ride in dirty diesel buses, but can ride ride in electric buses that are the future. They have an ability to work locally in their communities, to sit down and figure out what's your community plan to get clean energy moving forward. How do you make sure that we invest in transit and get your students to demand the kind of services they need to get around? There are many ways in which it's not just about what does the federal government or the international government do, because we know that in a democracy, that it's people that have to demand change. It's people that have to vote for change. So if you're a student and you have students that are 18 years old or older, tell them that their obligation, if they care about their family's health and their future, is to vote. Because the demo in a democracy, we have to speak for what we need. And the challenge today is young people are telling us what they don't want. Let's get them active in doing something and engaging in something hopeful, something active. Let them know that if they take up the mantle, as we did in the 50s and the 60s and 70s, and said, life ain't where we need it, not just on climate change, but lots of things, then we can make the world a better place. And if we just start there, we cut through the partisan politics and we cut through all the climate denial and we simply work together as a country, as a community of human beings, and we take back our future for them. Thank you.